How are you? Yes, I'm good. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> Actually, I'm in London as well. I got to London yesterday. Um, I don't know. Are you in London? Yeah, I am. Okay, I am. okay. okay. Whereabouts are you? Uh, I'm in Hackney, and I have to say, oh. this the summer weather is. <laughs> it's so. I'm even like it's so dark, and I'm like, why is it so dark? It's like middle of the day, but I'm gonna try and like be more in, like light. <laughs> yeah, be more in light metaphorically yeah. as well. Um, <laughs> well, I'm just gonna give a quick introduction. Um, my name is Tony Why Not, and we're here with Safe Space, a series where we talk about mental health and nightlife with my guests. And my guest today is Vanessa Maria. She's a DJ, radio host, podcaster, and advocate for mental health through radio shows on Black Butter Records, Resident Advisor, and her work with Don't Keep Hush. And I want to talk about all these things. And yeah, but my first question today is, how are you doing? I'm well, I think I found a good spot as well now that I'm like, okay, this seems more, <laughs> it seems more um, quiet, so I'm good. I'm doing really well, thank you. I've had a really fun week. I've done a lot of like adventure outdoor stuff. So I feel like really like restored and um, yeah, I feel quite positive about this week. So that's good. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I mean, outdoorsy stuff in London or outside? Yeah, yeah. I did like a, I went to like an adventure playground for my friend's birthday. Um, and I normally, I'm normally just like working, so it's so nice to be able to like take some time out. Um, yeah, let's keep, let's talk about work. Is it, do you work mostly in nightlife or do you have something else you do as well on the side? So I'm like a full, free, full-time freelancer. Full-time freelancer? <laughs> I don't think I've ever said that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm freelance. Um, so I do, I do like a lot of little different things. Um, and every day is quite different so obviously I DJ so I work in that life in that regard um, but I also like host a podcast for Resident Advisor I do a lot of like editorial work I do a lot of like content work and like I, I make content for like brands and stuff like I'm trying to avoid saying content creator but I guess that's what you can say <laughs> and, <laughs> um, and I also do like cons consultations and like talks and loads of loads of different different things so every day is always wow different. Yeah. keeping a busy schedule yeah i try i love i i get bored quite easily <laughs> <laughs> well that's good i mean content creator this is also a topic that we can talk about maybe but at least as a dj you know like creating content is also something that we do so much of our time and i said to other people before i feel like 60 percent of my, my job is just keeping up with social media and just like creating content and posting and all of that and is that something you find is fun for you or is that something that you see is problematic in our industry do you know what i feel like for a long time i was really not against it but i grappled a lot with like um showing up online and like having to do that side of like work but i think this year I, I can't remember who I was talking to, but someone said to me, like, in any job that you do, there's going to be things that you enjoy doing, things that you won't like doing, there's things that are going to be integral for you to, like, keep your position and, like, do, do, do your job. And um, he was, and I think this person, I think it was, I think it was this, I can't remember who said it, but they were like, um, content, creating content might not be your thing, you might not, like, enjoy doing it, but it's really going to support your, support your vision and where you want to go. Um, so it makes sense for you to to get good at it and learn how to do that. Um, and I think that was the first time I was like, okay, maybe I need to see it as more more of a sense of like it's something that I need to do, and I just I just bite the bullet and like learn how to do it because I think before I was like like kind of pushing away from it. And because when you're freelance, you're kind of like no one can tell me what to do. I don't have a boss. <laughs> like I'm my own boss. Um, and then someone was like, hold on, like, just because you're freelance doesn't mean there's things that, like, you need to be doing daily and, like, checking in on yourself for. Um, and I think that was, like, really helpful and valuable. Um, so I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of, like, it's a tool, like, use it the way you want to use it um, and find a way that's authentic to you. I think that's where I'm, and, and where I'm at at the moment. I, like, I really like that you said that, like, some find it in a way that's authentic for you because as it's still, it's, it's just a tool like it's not your life and it's not all your persona but i feel like for a lot of people it is like their whole life yes. and i feel like the younger people get the more they are like just their online personas it's quite weird but um yeah 
I, um, yeah, I wanted to ask, so just that, just diving right into the topic of mental health and nightlife, um, are there certain things that, since you are kind of, I mean, you are kind of an expert since you've been talking on panels and giving consultations and all of that, um, is there like a topic that really stands out for you that is problematic? Um, in regards to mental health in the nighttime economy? Or... Yes. Yes, yes, exactly. Like in the music industry, like something that people really struggle with, um, something that always co keeps coming up for people. I think the thing that I am trying to think about the most is like culture and like the work culture that we're creating in the industry that we exist in, just because that feeds into everything and all the like little subtopics that you hear about, whether it's drugs and alcohol abuse, um, whether it's work-life balance, um, whether it's like nepotism and like the who you know, whether it's like financial support when you're trying to get into an industry. It's like the culture that we're creating as an industry is like what I'm really keen on because at the moment I feel like the culture is like nonstop, number one, people are working 24 seven. Um, it's one of those things where you're just like, oh, it's like I'm in the music industry, so I'm just gonna have to, um, like I'm, I can't stop for anything or anyone and like that that is like obviously inherently unhealthy and when people you know talk about taking breaks and taking time off social media and I don't know having like a duvet day or whatever that sort of those two things don't exist and don't correlate um don't align and it can generate quite a lot of guilt I know people talk a lot about feeling guilty when they try and take time off work or um they feel like they're going to fall behind if you're an artist or an independent artist and you've not and you're like someone's telling you take a break of social media and you're thinking yeah but how am I going to you know engage with my fan base there's like so many elements to it whether you're a front-facing person or an artist or a creator or whether you're in the music side of the business working at labels and music companies I think both ends like the cultures that we're creating are actually more harmful than like beneficial to the long like long-term goals that everyone has for themselves in this in this space and I think that's quite an interesting thing to like analyze because we're always talking about like um legacy for artists we're always talking about like you know the, um how how long someone can stay consistent for and um like the journeys that companies take and like you know labels and how long they've, they've been existing and releasing music on but then when we look at the cultures that we're creating in order for those things to exist they actually are looking at like very short-term goals um so i'm always like i'm thinking about ways that we can like basically intervene and support people in a way that's like going to help them to stay in the industry <laughs> and not burn out because a lot of people burn out and they mm. leave yeah and you said you're saying the values have changed from like what used to be valued is now not so important anymore now it's more like how many followers you have or how many you know, like how, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't actually know a good example. Like what is a good example of a value now or culture that is? I, I think there is a, a big conversation around like numbers and stats. And there was an interesting thread on Twitter the other day uh, where someone talked about the fact that they don't think public, um, the public or fans should have access to numbers and statistics for their artists mm -hmm. and how that like basically um, feeds into this narrative that like you know the numbers are like where you value your worth as an artist which isn't true and it can and they talked about how that's quite harmful um and i thought that's quite an interesting like to like topic and debate about like whether like fans should have access to numbers like how many units were sold for a certain release like is that even important because i guess the argument was that's like it's not important um oh, oh you're saying numbers of like sales sales records and that sort okay. of stuff like yeah but at the end of the day but I mean, I feel like that would be weird because that feeds back into like, like fans seeing the numbers of how many followers you have or likes or watches yeah. of a certain video. And I feel like that's also, you know, like if, if you see someone has really high numbers and you're like, oh, that, they must be important. I want like, I like that. And that's like the spiral. Yeah. So if people could see um, how many records have been sold, I feel like that kind of blurs the the opinion of people if they like something or not you exactly know? but i feel like right now there's like access people can access that like there is access to those numbers that people always share 
there's there's there, it just, there's like as you said there's i think um there's a focus on certain like things that aren't actually important or do not constitute like you being a good artist um and i think it's harmful for fans and awful also for um, the artists themselves because you start like tapping into vanity me me metrics which don't actually matter um or they matter for certain things that aren't important to your craft or like your artistry um and then it can become quite difficult to like create and i when i used to work at sony i saw that pattern of like the blocks coming in for certain like artists um which is like which is just awful um so you gosh i can see yeah. how like things really affect like how it's a knock-on effect on different like levels and um I mean, when you when you re like research all these things and you talk about these things, how so you said you're also consulting people on this? Um, I do a lot of consultations for different like, companies on like mental health and like um, like equity and like how we can support upcoming artists in different spaces. Um, I do work with like Pyra. I do work with like um, yeah, just it's mostly on like. Um, not internal like HR stuff, but more like external community mm -hmm. building like work. That's amazing. How, how, so, how did you get into that? <laughs> you know what? I think I I, I don't know. I just um, I'm not. I actually <laughs> that's a good question. I think it just everything just happened like naturally. I I did a lot of I worked on a lot of projects like outside of what um, what I do what I did as like a full-time job so when i was working at like sony and stuff i was still doing like loads of different projects and i think from building up like my own independent projects i like met and like connected with different people across like the industry and then when things like pop up and like projects pop up like i guess i, I just get an email to get involved um there's a really good organization called black lives in music so i do a lot of like work with them i worked on like a survey that they put out um which basically audited um music companies across the uk and looked at how they support their like employees um especially with focus on like racism in music um which was like a really uh powerful piece of like data which has been really helpful in like in, basically instructing like, policies and structural changes in like government so like i think there's just like m there's loads of companies out there so it's like finding people that you want to work with and there's always um there's always a need for like more like hands-on like support so i think it's also just reaching out like i think that's how i got involved like i just would email people and be like i like what you're doing how can we work together so well so it's actually really naturally you just felt the call to do all of this but it's more so working with organizations than with individuals right yeah like a lot of a lot of like policies like like it's on like an organized like structural level so um yeah yeah i mean that's really where I feel like the change would happen is on a government level legislative you know changing the laws mm -hmm. on certain things but um I mean yeah like helping out the community and people that uh that are struggling that's also something I mean yeah I feel like a lot of people just get into that through like their own hard stories I mean at least uh, that was for me or a lot of guests that I talked to but um yeah, I think it's such a great thing that you're doing all these projects and it's it's a huge step. And I saw also on your um, Instagram that you've been doing like some videos, you know, like consulting people like these like these little little videos on tips and tricks and all that. And I think that's really, really helpful. And I wish my feed would be more populated by those things instead of scrolling along and just seeing seeing random things that don't really matter. Um, do you feel like you get a big response from doing stuff on Instagram like that? Or is that more? Um, yeah, I think like so. Side I, the side thing? Yeah, do you know what's so funny? Like I still get nervous to post those kind of videos. <laughs> Cause I just feel like sometimes I'm like, oh gosh, like, um, I don't know, do people just think like, we're gonna be like, oh god, stop, like shut up, type of thing. <laughs> um, so I, like, I, so it's funny. Like those are the videos that probably people always talk about the most, and that oh, like I really appreciate that. But for some reason, like it's always the ones that like I find it quite difficult to post. Yeah. Um, so I'm still like moving, like getting over that. But I think, yeah, I think it had it has had like good positive feedback. Um, just because it isn't like, 
like your typical like oh i've smashed like a festival set and it's like everything is always like self promo do you know what i mean um, yeah so it, it kind of gets it can get like quite boring um and it feels like i've always enjoyed like hearing people's like actual experiences um whether it's like positive or negative or like just neutral like it's just nice to hear from someone like directly um i think that's the way you connect the most as well so i really liked when you posted you know like when the drop didn't really hit or something yeah and so many people commented on it and actually liked it because i feel like it's something when you saw when, when you show some transparency and yeah. you know like your true self people actually really really appreciate it when you make sure that it's not just glitz and glamour online but it's like actually it's not always good like not every set is like a boiler room set where people freak yeah. out but i mean i feel like that's kind of what a lot of people expect or like yeah. think because they see that online and it's it's like this weird thing where we are between what's real and what's not real and i feel like a lot of the younger people that were they that couldn't go out during the pandemic you know like got like on tiktok and all this stuff got into this whole like tiktok tiktok techno stuff where people are just constantly bang 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 and it's just not what real reality is and Yeah, so I really appreciate that post you did. And I think it's so wonderful to actually be transparent and honest. Like, it's not always good. Yeah. Do you know what? I just, that, that one, I didn't even think about it. I just, I remember seeing, I was like, oh, yeah, like, like, yeah, I was just like, oh, this didn't, this did not bang. But that's kind of like, let me just, I didn't really think anything of it. Um, and it's nice that people, like, connected to it, I guess. But <laughs> it's always the things that you don't really think about. Um, yeah that that, that blow up <laughs> yeah it's kind of weird <laughs> I was just like, I kind of, yeah it's just like a random thing i was just like oh you know what I've, someone might appreciate just seeing it kind of flop in um, but it's the most human i mean yeah. that's why i keep like doing these chats with people because i feel like when we talk about real stuff i think that's that's what actually helps someone you know it's like not because we constantly compare ourselves to other people right this whole competition thing is It's really hard, especially in our industry, because you see all this content online. You're like, oh, should I be doing this and that? And when someone's honest like that, I think so many people are like, fuck, yeah, like I feel the same way. And yeah. and they really like that. So that's awesome. And I think, yeah, I really appreciate you doing that. Um, I'm going to ask you about Don't Keep Hush. I know, I mean, I've done, looked into it, but just for everyone who's watching and listening later on Spotify, um, can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yes, Don't Keep Hush is a platform that was founded by Fred, who runs a music company organization called Keep Hush. You might know it. Um, and this is like a sub brand and it looks at speaking about mental health through music. So we've done a lot of like music fundraising. We've had like events in the past um, and we are trying to create like a space and a community for people to come together outside of your traditional like club settings basically um where you can just connect and like talk about your experiences navigating the, the music industry in like a very just casual way um and we found like the need for that because most of the conversations we we're having were like why are we having it in like the smoking area or, like of a club or something it was like you know what i mean like people just people are able to like people seem to be able to be like quite open like um once they've had a few drinks and once they're like i don't know you know this out outside and I, it felt like a little bit i I was, I remember having a conversation where i was like oh I, like, i really like that people can be open but i was like it's so sad that we don't have that outside of that setting because then it's only like and then you're back in the club and then everyone's like oh i feel this way and they're all drunk and it's great but then like what about outside of that, that and like how can we facilitate like a community which um, looks at having those conversations without the need for like substance abuse, for example. Mm. Oh, that's amazing. And you didn't even think about doing it online. It's like an in-person thing. Yes, it's an in-person thing. We're, um, we're currently like, we have, we have something on the way, but I can't speak too much about it. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I love that those platforms exist or that you provide that space for people. because you know, like so many, people only look in nightlife for community and that's all they know and then outside of that they don't really have friends like all like all they when they see their friends it's when they go out and their substances involved you know so having somewhere to speak outside of that it's 
that's hard, but it's so important. So I'm happy that exists. I don't even know if that exists in America because I live in New York. So, and for me, obviously there, I feel like a lot of stuff is online, especially in the pandemic, like yeah. everything kind of moved online. And I don't think there is anything where you meet up in person and talk about your stuff. But do you feel like it's always the same individuals returning or is it always diverse? Well, we, um, we haven't like done, we have like a, we have like a project coming where we will be where basically um yeah we'll be partnering with a couple of people and like bringing people together in a certain space or so i can't really speak too much about it yet but we haven't done we haven't like organized like our consistent like meetups yet um but i think the people that have come in the past have, and it's always been quite different i don't know i feel like it speaks to like the key posh community um, so probably key members from that space and um, yeah I think I think it yeah I think it's it's always quite different I think London is also quite big so there's always like different faces and stuff nice I mean I guess you have to keep hush about what's going <laughs> <laughs> um, but is there any other project because yeah, I feel like you've do, you're doing so much so it's kind of hard for me to kind of be like what about this and that mm -hmm. like when you say you know you do like the podcast on resident advisor like so you, you do that with individuals or is that also like a group scenario so the the podcast project is a partnership between black minds matter um and resident advisor so um there's we film four audio documentaries each year and they look at supporting like black owned businesses and individuals in dance music so we just released an episode on loneliness um, which had conductor and Sharice C um, as participants. So um, I basically like we brainstorm ideas and then we think about what talent could like fit into those spaces. Um, and our next episode is actually going to be looking at ADHD um, mm. in music. So it's going to be really exciting. Uh, we're just planning that at the moment. Uh, so yeah. So it kind Gosh, of yeah yeah sorry. So kind of the, the contributors always change each um, episode, um, but the premise like remains the same. Um, All right. But ADHD is huge. I mean, I, I feel yeah. like the more and more people are getting diagnosed and it's definitely, you know, I just spoke to a colleague today. Um, she's also a DJ and she just said, yeah, I just got diagnosed with ADHD and it's kind of crazy. Like, like to think you get diagnosed as an adult but like more and more people come up with these diagnoses so either people were always like that or it's it's like a trend that people get become or like, like get adhd more and more but it's wild to me that it's just such a growing thing but i mean it's all across the board with a lot of mental things like if it's depression or anxiety but i feel like do you think ADHD, the ADHD is something you're born with or it's something that you develop? Um, I'm not too sure. I think, um, I'm not sure I have to research, research. I'm like, yeah, I don't <laughs> want to speak on anything that I don't yeah, know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um, but no, that's really exciting that you have all these cool things coming up. But um, like you said before, like the number one topic that's coming up is when cultures are being pushed um, to a thing where um yeah like you said before like things that are uncomfortable um like numbers that are being pushed that are not real do you have another example of a culture that's being pushed where you think that's problematic yeah i wouldn't say it's a culture i'd say like the work culture overall in like the industry doesn't like support like a balanced lifestyle mm. but i think everyone can like agree with that especially as djs like we all know DJs are like inherently unhealthy and you have to take a lot of different steps to mitigate like the spaces that you'll be in. Even just like on a, on a very basic level, you're not going to be getting enough sleep. And like, it doesn't really matter what you do. If you have a 4 a.m. set, like, you know what I mean? Like you're, you're probably going to be lacking a bit of sleep and sleep is one of the number one restorative things that you can do for your body. So already like this, the, the job that we're doing it's already on a we're already on a back hill we're we're, we're we're walking up a mountain and there's like things dropping on us you know what I mean? it's not it's not um it's hard to like maintain like a healthy lifestyle when you're DJing but I would say um another um topic that comes up a lot, a lot of the time probably 
would be like it would probably be like to do like self-doubt and the um ability to stay like, consistent in a space which is so like out of your control i think there's a lot of factors that like you actually control when it comes to your success as an artist or as a dj there's um there's a lot of luck involved and i think that people don't talk about it enough like how like the people that you might meet or just the opportunities that you might get um or like the biggest opportunities that uh basically support like any sort of commercial success that you have as an artist a lot of those big like stepping stones are actually like down to like luck and like factors that like mm. you can't like curate for yourself no matter how hard you work so i feel like there needs to be more of a conversation around like hard work and talent and luck because a lot of the time some of the narratives that we're fed is like this person is just so hard working this person is so talented um which isn't which i'm saying it's not tr i'm not saying that's not true mm -hmm. these people might really be very hard working and very talented but that's not the only factor because most djs i know are hard working it's a hard it's a hard job like you, you have to be on job like you you work hard um and in fact that goes into like more of a wider conversation around like talent and like work and what constitute as hard work and we can get into that in like another time but i just do feel like uh having more of a transparent conversation around like um outstanding factors uh would help like young younger like up and coming artists to really feel like they are doing enough and like it's okay that you haven't had this opportunity like you don't know what is happening behind closed doors or like <sighs> someone's luck do you know you, you cannot you cannot yeah, manufacture luck. yeah absolutely <laughs> no it's like also what you said in your video with um um like delay not deny type of yeah. thing where you know I, I mean i never thought about this luck thing but it's really true like the most the most situations that pushed me the most in my career were such little random moments i had no yeah. control over but um yeah there's definitely a talent like you said, talent and hard work, luck. But then there's also situations where you just have advantages, you know, yes. like having money or, you know, oh, certain other cultural like advantages. So it's like the mix of all these different things. And yeah, like the whole doubt thing is definitely a huge topic when people are like, mm -hmm. I mean, I catch myself all the time, you know, in one moment I'm like, oh yes, like I'm the best, like I'm doing this and this. And then the next day I'm like, Oh, am I, is this good enough especially when making music because yeah. like as an artist you lose perspective so quickly on if it's good or not because you're so in it mm -hmm. like even mm -hmm. djing but um mm -hmm. talking about your your personal life i saw that you want to stop djing is that something you're still thinking of no i, I think i don't know what you saw but i definitely was like <laughs> thinking of quit i mean i think i'm quitting like every week <laughs> not anymore i used to like i think in the beginning um yeah social proof someone said social privileges knowing the right people absolutely like people do not talk about like their like what's it called social currency and like nepotism is obviously like the word everyone always uses but it's it's just so true it's, <laughs> it's true so, it is it's just facts like it's it's insane like when you hear, especially the stories you hear about certain people like who are like at the top of their game and like the the privilege that they had in order to get to those positions it's not taken away from their talent but i think it's important for context because if we're comparing each other everyone's comparing themselves to everyone all the time but it's important to realize like we're comparing you can't compare those two things no you cannot <laughs> if, someone, if someone's you know parents are like i don't know a and r's and working so or whatever like it's just it's it's you can't compare that like of course there's an advantage there that you just can't you wouldn't be able to like create for yourself um but this idea of like working hard means that you should be able to like create these opportunities for yourself if you work hard enough mm. which is a myth it doesn't exist it's completely false um but so on the topic of um you were talking about sorry i've lost my train of <laughs> no i i mean no we're just circling back to that yeah. topic i mean just like creating opportunities for yourself and i feel like yeah. You know, living in New York, I don't know, like the hustle is so, so hard. And I'm sure London is similar, but like people are just, I remember when I started DJing, I hustled so, so hard and just like elbows everywhere. And you're like competing with everyone and it's crazy. And like now, obviously it's a little bit easier, like the, the, not the higher, I mean, just like the further along you are in life, like things just, you know, you know, more people and stuff, but like 
when you're just starting out like where the fuck do you even start like it's kind of it's crazy like networking you have to show your face all the time you have to be partying all the time and now you know that like i'm completely sober and i don't really go out at all unless i'm djing you know i'm like oh maybe i'm missing all these opportunities like meeting the right people and like talking to the right people and and all that like i can't afford to be in ibiza like for a whole summer so you know like people that do that i'm a little bit like you know so i understand that the self-doubt exists and it comes really easily all the time but i'm glad to hear that that's definitely a topic that you've been discussing a lot with people and just knowing that you're enough and just you know you're doing enough and you, you can't do more you're already doing your best like comparing mm -hmm. yourself to others that are obviously from a different standpoint is yeah it's so important so i'm glad that we're talking about this um and for your own self-doubt you that's what we're actually talking about um yeah when you say like you want to quit djing every week like that's obviously self-doubt right i hope you're yeah not. i think it, yeah definitely i think it was self-doubt but it's also I, I think i just got really tired um of I don't know i think i just got tired i was like this whole thing is very tiring and i think there's a point where you're just like um not everyone but i was i definitely got to a point where i was like oh i don't know if i can keep up with like the content with like um the online stuff at the time i was working full time i'm like i'm working full time and then i'm like djing on the weekends and um it was just i, I was just like what what is the perk like why am i doing it and I think you get reminded, I think return, as I always say when people are unsure about the direction they want to go in or whether they want to quit or whatever, I'm always like, let's just return to that reason of like why you started and like why you did it in the first place. And if that's, that is still like, like a, if that's strong, if you still connect to that right reason and, re and it resonates, like that's a pretty good sign, like that you still enjoy doing what you're doing, but maybe mm. you just need to like take some moments, take a, maybe do something differently. Um, isn't it sometimes it's not about quitting maybe it's just about taking a different approach to like what you're trying to do and that definitely helped me because I was like oh no I, I do actually you know what I love it <laughs> I, I love it so much I wouldn't be able to like you know stop um but I think that yeah that is that has helped me I remember saying that to my therapist my therapist um I said I wanted to quit my therapist said quit then and that's when I knew I didn't because I was like, what do you mean? I was like, I was like, what do you mean? She, she was just like, quit, like, do it, do it right now, quit, quit it right now. And I was like, oh my gosh, like, how could you say that? Like, I've worked so hard. Like, why would I just quit? And she was like, obviously, you don't want to quit. And I was like, okay, maybe you proved my point. Oh my God. <laughs> also, quitting is such a hard thing. Like, there's such a definite thing of like, I'm never going to do this again. Yeah, like, it's like... I mean, it's part of your soul and your spirit, like music is part of your life. And I think, yeah. yeah, when I hear people quitting, like I think the approach of taking a break, like you said, is is probably also easier on your own mind. Cause when you quit, you're like, oh no, now I can't go back. Like now I told everyone that I quit. <laughs> like it's kind of- You can always yeah, come back, so you can always come back. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but I know what you mean. It makes it, it does make it considerably harder. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> But I know like a lot of people like even bigger, like really big DJs that are taking breaks. And I really admire that because it takes a lot of courage to just be like, you know what, like this is really hard right now and my mental health is not coping and I'm taking a break. And I admire that so much. And I think it takes so much strength to do that way more than like pulling yourself through burnout probably. Cause I mean, that's obviously really hard as well. And I can't speak for people who've done that, but I just really admire when someone's like, this is enough and I have to stop. And I think it gives a good example for people to be like, it's okay to take a break. It's okay to mm -hmm. breathe or not play every weekend, four times a week. Like it's like, it's just crazy. And I mean, I have my own rule. I only play once a week. Cause I can't, like I have some physical things. Like I cannot do more. And like you said before, no matter how we do it or what we do, like sleep will always be something that's missing. Like, you know, like this weekend, and I'm going to play a set from four to six and I only play once a week, but I already know it's not going to be much sleep that night. And mm -hmm. like, I'm already like struggling to cope with that. And that's, that's every weekend. So it's kind of, you know, like I couldn't do it more than once a week. And I don't, when I see people playing four or five times, I mean, the summer goes is crazy for some people. And it's just, yeah, I'm having a hard time understanding how they can do it. I mean, some people can, but others can't. And I think, 
knowing your own limit is probably the most important thing exactly i think it's, it's so difficult and just when you were speaking it reminded me of something um someone literally put it on twitter today it was like um no one's talking about the difficulty that um, women have as DJs when it comes to like deciding whether their career is more important or whether having children is more important just because like just being a caregiver like four to six like it's going to be difficult like to to, ha to have a baby <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah, it's, just, absolutely. It's, it's like one of those one of those things and I think um yeah you get to a point where I guess you do think about you're like okay well how does this lifestyle like fit into some of like my, my wider goals as like just a person as a human being because that's what I'm I'm before I'm an artist before I'm like a DJ I'm I'm a human <laughs> so of what course. do I want what, what do I want to get from life and I it made me think this morning a lot about like future goals and like just just how and how some women have like been able to do both which is I find so like amazing like incredible yeah it's so hard and actually it's a topic that I talk about so much with my colleagues yeah. or female colleagues um because it's really i mean i know people who are doing it and it's working well but in the end if you're you know i mean obviously chun has to come to a certain age where it doesn't matter if it's you know the parent like you know one parent can always take care but as long as you're breastfeeding all that and i have a colleague um, i mean i won't say her name but like she just she had a baby like two years ago and she went out clubbing for fun, like not even for her own set. And people in like people that she knows are like, oh, aren't you supposed to be home with your child? Like oh, shaming her. And that's to a point where I'm like, if you decide to have a child, you should, you know, like have your own rules on how to deal with it. And I actually, I think it's amazing if you have a strong partner and you're somehow able to manage all of it. Like mm -hmm. I really admire that. And fuck yeah, you should go out out and like have fun and dance just for fun like my god like if the guy was like if the dad was doing that no one would ask a question and those are the topics where i'm obviously like don't even get me started <laughs> yeah i completely agree with that like like it's, it's double standards i mean we could just be here all day really <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's a whole different topic of, yeah you know but um yeah choosing the career is and I even thought about that, and you know, right now I don't have a partner, but like, do I want a child even without a partner or when do I want to have kids? I'm in my thirties now and I'm like, there's only so much time and men don't have to think about this. So it's kind of, that. yeah, that's a difficult topic, but again, we could sit here all day. No, it's, about it, it. no, hundred percent. It's really, it's so hard. Like I, there was, um, uh, there was like a panel that bumble had like uh curated with which looked at like women within the creative industry um and there was like a few people sitting on there like creative directors stylists i think um there's a producer as well and the conversations uh they were talking about relationships and stuff and they got to the point where it was like partners and children and every single one of these women were single um they did not have partners they didn't have kids and obviously they were extremely successful in all of their like um achievements and all of them were like this is the only area that like we've just not been able to like you know lock into and it's and they were saying that it got to a point where it was just like it wasn't it was just an active choice not to engage anymore because it was just it was just difficult being like successful as a woman trying to find like a partner and then being able to like find like the time to slot it into like the lifestyle that they were living as creative people um and i think all of them decided to like freeze their eggs so mm -hmm. yeah it's also a big topic amongst my friends right now not even like people in the music industry just like friends that have careers yeah. and it's yeah. just oh where do we even start <laughs> listen <laughs> it's... yeah but it's a lot of pressure i feel like it's a lot of pressure from all sides like in the society from family like you know, as a woman you should have a child like you know what you can just do whatever you want you're human and if you need to take care of yourself first and the decision is yours like we don't need to have kids we don't want to and like that's what i for my personal thing came to the conclusion with if it happens it happens and if not then I have more time for myself and that's fine. I have some nieces and nephews and that's good too, oh, you know, so. I love that, yeah. <laughs> Those are enough kids in my life right now, but who knows. Yeah. Um, I feel like we totally 
sideline with this topic now. <laughs> we have. Um, but so, yeah, I don't want to like ask too many personal things because, you know, if you don't want to like talk about it, then I totally understand. No, it's but... fine. I'm very open. <laughs> okay. But like, um, like you said before, it was really natural to, you know, be like, engaging with companies that you want to work with and reaching out to them being like hey i like what you're doing blah blah let's like you know let's work together but is there like a story from yourself where you know that topic of mental health is is obviously not something that everyone thinks about or talks about but like a lot of people just straight up don't really like they're like oh yeah i don't feel good or you know whatever but like they don't really you know think about it too much and obviously the way you work with mental health in that industry is is you know it's really on top of what you're what you're thinking probably all the time is there something that i mean i don't want to ask like if there's something that happened but like why yeah. is that topic so big for you basically? you know what you know sometimes i'm like yeah why do i i think i've always had um i've always like struggled with my mental health and i think it was only until like this year where i like, really understood like why like maybe I'm like really focused on it and like why it means so much to me. Um, Cause I sat, I was sitting on a panel the other day and they were, we were asked the question was quite similar, which was like, what are some of the biggest barriers or challenges that you face as an individual? Mm. Um, and people, you know, brought up, question, brought up things around like self-esteem or like financial barriers or just like not being able to know the right people. And then I really was like, okay, like what is actually being the barrier for me? Um, and I just, and I realized it was like a lot of like trauma that I had like on not processed yet from like my childhood and like that sort of stuff. And I was like, damn, like this was actually, this is probably being like the number one barrier in my life because that trauma that was unchecked had like fed into so many different things. And like, I spoke about how that like constituted in my like low confidence, like especially as a teenager, it affected like the way I viewed myself and others. It affected um, the relationships that I was forming, um, the ability to, I guess, like accept myself for who I was and also just give things a go. Like it took a while for me to like learn how to DJ. Um, mm. Like it, what, do you know what I mean? But I've always wanted to DJ, like just small things like that. And like, obviously those are all like little topics, but they, I think they all feed into like the wider, the wider picture of just like um, understanding like how my experiences like shaped and informed me as an individual. Um, and especially like coming into like university and like um, into like some of my first like roles and like in 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 like the creative industry, I think that's when I probably had like some of my worst experiences with mental health from like depression and anxiety and um, just PTSD as well. Like I think all of those things like really deeply affected me, and I there wasn't much space like to for support. There wasn't much like help, mm -hmm. and I found it really difficult to talk about. Um, but then I, I got to a point where like I, I met certain people, certain artists, there's an artist called Mira May who's amazing from the UK. She's very outspoken about her mental health. She just recently had a baby um, and she talks about her experiences um, with wanting to like unalive herself and like she's just so open about it and that really like resonated with me and I was like it made me feel like I wasn't alone. I was like wow maybe I'm not like crazy <laughs> you know I mean? yeah that's like amazing. maybe i'm not like i'm like wow like someone else feels like this like this is great and i remember feeling that feeling that feeling of being seen was so powerful for me to move through like some of the things that i was experiencing mm. i was like damn like imagine if everyone was just doing this like everyone would feel seen all the time and we'd all feel like validated for how we were experiencing life and like maybe the load and the burden wouldn't be so great and we wouldn't have to carry it by ourselves and I feel like meeting people who were so open, like it, that definitely like pushed me to be more open myself. So shout out to everyone who's ever like, I don't know, cried on, on a panel or just spoke their truth at an event because that like, it, it definitely does help so much. And it, it has like a, a, an, a, like a push on effect where like people are just like then deciding to do that for themselves. That's amazing. And I mean, thank you so much for sharing. It takes, you know, like we're just talking about this, like you sharing this, like someone might, might hear and see that and then they're like, wow, they feel seen and stuff. So if, yeah, like you said, it just spirals into, into that. So I'm so happy that you found that space, you know, work for you and probably DJing as well, like work through your own emotions and, 
and what happened to you. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I think that takes a lot of courage to be so open. But like we said before, um, you know, like looking through your videos and like saying when you, you know, like sharing little tips and stuff, people feel so seen or, or like your video when you're like, oh, the drop didn't hit. I mean, it's probably so popular because people feel seen and you're just being transparent and honest about it. Um, so that's really big. Uh, yeah, I'm so happy that we're talking today. And I just have a last question for you. Um, are there any tools and stuff, you know, that, that could help when people are struggling or someone who's watching, they're really having a hard time in life right now. Are there some personal things that you do for yourself that, that help help you stay sane? First of all, I'd say if you are really struggling, please find like professional support um, and speak to a uh, professional about it, whether it's a therapist or um, if you get referred to by your doctor. But um, yeah, definitely professional support first. Um, and for me personally, like the biggest thing that's ever helped me, um, what's interesting is, has actually been like a personal connection, having a space with a friend. It doesn't have to be a friend. It could be like a family member or someone that you really trust, but having a space where you are able to be your authentic self and really bring like your true feeling to that space. And whether it's like, um, you're feeling depressed or uh, last year I was really feeling very suicidal and like that was a really difficult thing for me to like navigate because I've never really been at that point. But I had a friend who would like FaceTime me and she was like, how do you feel? And I would just tell her like, you know, this is how I feel. Like I just, I feel really suicidal. And she was like, okay, like let's, 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 let's navigate. Let's, let's, let's discuss that. Like it was like discussing like any sort of issue that I had. And it really helped me to like make peace with that. Cause I was like, oh, like, why does it have to be a taboo? It doesn't have to be a taboo. Like someone can like just hear it and, I think people get quite scared when they hear that term. Mm. But my friend was like, she was like, we're facing it. We're getting, we're getting a cup of tea. We're getting some biscuits and let's fucking have a, let's have a discussion. Let's actually like talk through this. Like, it's okay that you feel that way. Like, why do you feel that way? Like, let's, let's have a, let's open it up. Like a, like an, an authentic like dialogue around this topic. And that was the single thing that really saved my life. Like wow. I, I joke about it, but it saved my life. Like having someone to be compassionate and say that they love you in a place where you feel so broken and so like hopeless like for someone to just be there and like tell you that you're that, that it doesn't matter that how you feel that you are still loved was the thing that helped the most and I could talk about exercise and I could talk about supplements I take so many supplements I can talk about all these different things but truly in my biggest moment of despair that connection and that feeling of love was the single thing that pulled me out <laughs> oh my god that's i'm i'm so touched by that and i'm so sorry that you went through this and i'm even happier that you're you know you're glowing right now and you're living <laughs> life so um <laughs> that's powerful my god but yeah it's true i mean obviously talking to a professional but also knowing that you're loved and seen yeah that's so big like, i mean mm. i hope everyone has a friend like that you know <laughs> shout out to Nazra man and I, I, and then I think of the offset of that like obviously not everyone has a friend like that but then I think thinking about it the biggest thing that you could do is finding the language learning the language um, researching the language needed in order to have authentic powerful conversations around mental health like really finding the language for that because not everyone can speak about mental health in a way that is number one not triggering and in a way that is like going to benefit like the individual so really like taking responsibility as an individual and like working through um like just like your own stereotypes on mental health like whether it especially going into like schizophrenia and um mm. like like that, those those are some of the conditions that people know the least about um but i think having having the language to discuss that with someone um and being able to um, do that in a healthy way will be so powerful because then, then we could all like have like great interpersonal relationships with people and someone to lean on because we know oh this person like understands what I'm saying um, and they're not afraid to have that conversation but um I mean so learning language you mean you mean le like le like le just learning more about it more awareness because like I see that with like yeah. people with disabilities working in nightlife because I've 
I've dealt with that a bunch and I know that there's no language around that and people are scared of people that have disabilities and it's kind of do you mean that yeah or okay yeah. like the language is like learning like the way to communicate and like um hold a conversation with those things because like even myself as someone who like has worked in this area and like you know talks about this area like like I like even sometimes I'm I'm like oh damn like this is like let me let me actually like learn like do better and like find um the right words to use for example if someone was to come with me and say that they're having hallucinations like hallucinations like what how would I like mm. how like navigate that and I think you can be like surprised by like how little you do know um and just take taking some time out to like think about those things you never know could be like um could save someone's life someone close to you in the future um just have being able to like facilitate and hold space for people because holding mm. space, like is a really powerful thing to do and holding like a space that is really open and loving is actually quite difficult to do because like it's really easy for your own stereotypes and like your own thoughts and stuff to like um i mean like paint not paint but i think like push like a, a conversation in a certain way um where really you just want to create a space for someone to just like be open like you don't want to like direct that conversation it's for them to like just be able to speak freely yeah exactly that's really i mean yeah wow but um that i mean just that made me think of something that i saw like i saw someone post about this where people want to chat and then sometimes like they want to chat about stuff like you know just chit chat about things that are actually really affecting some people like health or like racism or you know just like things that are obviously you know like stuff with disability that's something that affects me personally and when people just chit chat about that topic that really that i feel like that's really triggering and then they haven't really learned the language around that or like mm. you know like the concept of, of being binary or non-binary and gender like someone who's being who you know is non-binary if someone who's binary just starts like chatting about that topic like a chit chat ignorant way i feel like that's really triggering for a person like yeah. that so stuff yeah learn your, your language that's really big learn, i've definitely learn. been triggered in the past where i'm like if you don't know shit about this topic please shut up because yeah i don't want to talk about this and yeah creating a safe way to talk about this topic yeah that's big and i also have a lot to learn <laughs> i mean like we, everyone, all, yeah, we, we all do do. <laughs> do you know what i mean yeah. i think someone someone said to me yesterday like the re the way you know you've like grown up is when you realize you know nothing and i was like <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> when i was 25 i was like oh my gosh like i just know nothing like i had this massive <laughs> epiphany of being like like of what yeah. what is life and that's when i was like cool <laughs> I guess I'm an adult now. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's so true. And then you realize, like, well, there's a whole world out there that you can learn. You can actually learn about. Mm. You don't know anything. Yeah. Um, you know nothing, John Snow. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> Love that. But um, are there any last words or thoughts that you want to say for people that are watching or listening? I just want to say thank you so much for have like hosting this conversation and like holding space for us and like continuing to like platform people as well I think it's so important um and I've really enjoyed like speaking with you today so thank you likewise thank you I feel like it was a really easy chat and I mean speaking about creating language around like stuff like hosting something like this I feel like it's really difficult because you know like how do I ask questions that are not too personal or offen offensive or stuff like that so yeah thank you for opening my eyes again about that as well because you know like I'm not a professional interviewer. I'm just like another artist that wants to talk to other people. So I'm, I'm learning as well. But thank you so much for being here and talking to me. And I've only this year started talking to people that I actually personally don't know, like talk like, you know, on this platform. So um, yes, I'm always quite nervous when I'm talking to someone who I feel like, yeah, you know so much about this. And I don't know oh, no, no, absolutely not. No. <laughs> but still um well thank you yeah thank you so much and i'll definitely send you the link once it's on spotify and um yeah thank you so much and i hope you have a great afternoon thank you same to you yeah thanks and i'll speak to you soon okay speak to you soon bye, bye. bye. thanks